Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam Ala ashraf al-anbiya wal mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'id My dear respected brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh Jazakallah khair for coming And for participating in this second of the five part series uh, dedicated to uh, just uh, gender relations and marriage. Today, inshallah, the, um, the topic before me is uh, whether, you know, assessing whether or not you are ready for marriage. And um, I always found it interesting when people call the title of something. So this one is called, Are You Ready? And it took me back to, um, it's a re regrettable how the words are, but it took me back to uh, the morning of, uh, of September the 11th when the attacks happened. One of the um, because Muslims were not sophisticated with making flyers and posters for our events in terms of how we label them. We don't think about the rest of society. So one of the brothers was calling when I was president of MSA saying that uh, in case you get any backlash from this campus, just let you know we took down all the flyers and inshallah everything's under control. I go, what happened? He goes, Imam Siraj was supposed to come, that Tuesday was the attacks and Friday he was supposed to come to speak. And the flyers literally said, are you ready to die? Because they want to talk about Akhirah. And so here were all the Muslims plastering the campus with uh, posters that said, are you ready to die? <laughs> and so he was like, I just want to let you know, we took down all the posters, uh, we're done. So, so when we talk about this stuff, it's better to complete that sentence. Yeah. <laughs> are you ready for marriage? Yeah, inshallah. Um, so, to, I mean, to begin, you know, with um, uh, just assessing, it could be a very sort of psychological exercise to see if somebody is ready or not. But in Islam, we begin by basing the fact that human relationships, uh, according to the, the religion, were, uh, um, were regulated, if you will, in, in a way that made the nikah, or the, the act of uh, uh, writing a contract, the ketb kitab the formal way to declare that a man and a woman were now permissible to be with one another within the confines of a marriage as husband and wife. And, and the Prophet وسلم, in Sayyid al-Bukhari said then, inna min sunnatina, that indeed from our sunnah is a nikah. Wa man raghiba, and the one who is not on our sunnah, he said, falaysa minna, that the person is not from our community. And essentially what that meant was that the, the, the idea of, uh, attribute, you know, of uh, accepting that marriage is a part of a, of a human being's transition from childhood to, you know, to adolescence to, to adulthood, if you will, that this was something that kept you with, on the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu So it's something that's encouraged, it's something that, uh, that he, uh, he talked about. And then he also said that one who is able to, to marry, and that person who has the means, if you will, to get married should marry. And one who cannot face, in the translation, cannot face the consequences, if you will, of marriage, which means several. It could mean personal readiness, it could mean financial readiness, it could mean all of those things. Then the idea was that uh, for that person, for alayhi uh, for that and for that person, fasting was prescribed. And here, I want to pause because, you know, often people sort of go uh, very fast past that. The religion is a very natural religion. It acknowledges that with adolescence and the idea of physiological changes and biological changes, that there would be an, uh, an awakening of sorts of desires uh, where the man would notice that the woman, woman exists in a, in a sexual way, if you will, and that the woman would acknowledge that the man exists. And so here, it's very natural to say that if you feel, if you feel these feelings, if you see these things, or if you sort of are, are overcome by this, it's not something that anybody says, you know, is, uh, is unnatural. It is quite natural. But here, the Prophet is saying that you may start to experience these feelings, and yet there are guidelines with which how to, you know, uh, uh, go about expressing those desires, if you will, or fulfilling those desires, and the ideal of which is marriage. But when you cannot reach that, then physiologically speaking, we know that fasting has several uh, 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 impacts on a human being. One of them, which is to really uh, uh, turn all of the concentration from the lower desires to the higher desires, if you will, the intellectual sort of desires. And this is why if, in, if you read in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about fasting, does not talk about fasting so that you can experience hunger or thirst. He doesn't say that. In other parts of the Quran, we, we read about hunger and thirst. But he says that uh, fasting is prescribed upon you as it was prescribed upon those before you. So that you may achieve taqwa. 
And taqwa, God consciousness, is really a way to say it. Some people call it fear, but I, I prefer, and others I've seen more and more using God consciousness, that is a kind of self-restraint that is inspired by God consciousness. So as we talk about whether or not a person is ready, that really is the first part. That you have to literally ask yourself, what is your level of taqwa? There's no meter until now. There's no app for that. So you're just going to have to sort of know. And what that means is essentially that when you're alone, who are you? When you're alone, who are you? How do you function when you're alone? What are you most inclined to do? And are you God conscious in your actions? And here we stop to also say that this notion of preparing for marriage, if a person is not clear about their relationship with Allah, it's a relationship. And that's why in so many ways the poets used to talk about the love for Allah, like hub, love for Allah. And love is the same word. We don't use a different word when we talk about love for human beings. It's the same word, love. And that the idea that knowing the, uh, who Allah is and realizing that He gave us certain rights, certain roles, and certain responsibilities. If these are not known to you, then even beginning to talk about marriage is really probably the last thing anyone should be considering. And I'll tell you why. At the worst, at the least of it, it is that the day the man, especially, I turn to the brothers, the day the kitab is written, the contract is written, and you are now said, in, even if you have a small walima, and we'll, we can talk about that in another lecture, uh, and you're now husband and wife, you begin to become the imam of that household. There are some basic expectations of you. You're not supposed to be like a you know, like the super imam or anything like that, but there are some basic expectations that you would know how to lead salah. And we take it for granted because we're in a masjid now, and we're, you know, most people who have come here are in part of the Adams family, so you at least come in and out of the masjid, so you do the basic things as it is. But this is not to be taken for granted, because marriage can be a turning point. It can take a person who didn't, was very weak in this taqwa area, with knowing much about knowledge, and turn them into really somebody very strong because the person they married says that I demand that we both learn together and we improve. Or if they're weak and they marry someone and that person is weak and getting weaker, then the only way both of them can end up is to go down in their relationship with Allah and their ability to succeed. Right? So it's kind of an intuitive way of looking at it, but that's essentially what we're talking about. And so with taqwa, we're really saying that if your fara'id are not being, you know, if the fara'id of the obligatory are not being fulfilled, then marriage is really not immediately the responsibility, something immediately be considered, because there's some homework to be done. And here, you know, uh, we also talk about some sisters get proposals from brothers who, you know, may say things like, you know, I'm just, you know, really into my career, so I'm, I'm not praying all the prayers, but I try to get them in as much as possible. But sometimes I end up doing like all four of them at one time just because of my career. But after marriage, I know I think I'll change. So you can say that in that case, why don't you work on that? And then let's talk about this, you know, after some time. Why don't you work on that first? Because this is not a layaway plan. This is not something where you say, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll promise to get better. And similarly for the sisters, if they're, you know, if they're having some uh, uh, known uh, neglect within their, their relationship with Allah, and those things. And so when the Prophet said, marry the one who reminds you of Allah, here you're saying that if that person has taqwa, then clearly in trying to get to know them for marriage and getting to know their family and whatnot, your main thinking pattern revolves around Allah. It's not a dunyatic uh, 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 thinking pattern, it's a akhirah oriented thinking pattern. So you think about how with this person I'll get to Jannah. Because of this person, I'll improve. Not because I am not doing everything, and so suddenly this person will make me a better person. No, but through that person, inshallah, and they're and they're and working together, it'll be a, you know a, an improvement. So that's the one big thing. And truly, you have to stop here and realize that the qadr of Allah in such a way that through knowing Allah, you can be you can be told a lot about yourselves. And people say this often: is that I didn't know myself until I got to know Allah. Because Allah opens your eyes, your senses, your other senses, but specifically your heart. And if the qadr of Allah, if, the, if really the plan of Allah, He has ordained that for you, 
and for some people it's uh, anger management. For other people, it's the you know the uh, ability to uh, acquire something in life. For others, but if he has willed that, ordained that marriage will be your test. It's the worst thing you can have is if you didn't focus on taqwa and having the self-restraint and all of those things and that marriage became your worst test. And we don't mean this as a threat to anyone or as a, you know, a way to say, you know, so be scared and don't get married. But we're just saying we don't know, none of us know. And why, that's why the Quran says very clearly that your, your azwaj, your, your wives and your children, that uh, indeed they are a source of fitna, not in the sense that they would create, you know, uh, um, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, challenges for you just because they want to, but just having a wife or having a husband and children could become a source of trial and tribulation for you in a very difficult way. And so if you don't have that number one point straight, uh, really uh, everything else is not, uh, not helpful. So the second point is the nafs. And here we talk about nafs awareness, like we, you know, basically self-awareness. But in Islam, just limiting it to the self is meaningless unless you talk about the state of the soul. And oftentimes we refer to the soul as the nafs. And which is why in Surah ar rum in the verses of marriage, um, uh, the verses recited often at a, at a marriage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after talking about how the heavens and the earth praise Him and everything uh, uh, is, is uh, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجٍ That from among His signs is that He has created for you from your souls, from your own souls, your pair. So we used to think that, oh, it's very Western, sort of, you know, kind of a non-Muslim non sort of thinking to say soulmate, like I'm looking for my soulmate, right? We talk about soul searching, looking for my soulmate. Well, this verse tells you that there is such a, such a thing, that there is a soulmate, because Allah has created for you a pair, uh, a mate, if you will, as the translation goes, from among your souls. But the nafs and being aware of the nafs is something of a very personal exercise. It's not something that happens on Facebook walls. It's not hap something that happens in tweets or in Instagrams. It happens literally when you are alone and you realize that were it not for the grace of Allah that you would be destroyed. And what I mean by that is that if it wasn't that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept being merciful towards me that something of me, so if it's my impatience, my anger, my uh, desire to eat too much, my desire to drink too much, my desire to be you know, involved in sort of you know, either drugs or alcohol, and this is, I'm not making this stuff up, it's very much a Muslim issue, it's not a non-Muslim issue. All these things can happen. So the nafs and the state of the nafs tells us that by understanding where do I incline the most, and the Qur'an gives us three states of the nafs and three states of the soul and most of you already know this. Um, so the idea is that on the one hand you have where most of us are. I would say maybe you know, some 75, 80, 90 percent, there's no statistics but I'm just saying most of us are in what is the nafs uh, al-lawama. Uh, uh, that the idea is that we are thinking of doing something, we're tempted to do something and then here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again by His grace, we realize that, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that. Sometimes it's parental shame. Sometimes we think, what if, I know I'm in the mall, but if I do this, it's going to through the auntie network, which is faster than the NSA. It will get back to my mom and dad, and that keeps me from doing what I was about to do. Right? So that keeps me. Other times, it's actually nothing and no one else. And it's literally just Allah, and so I don't do it. So most of the times, I'm, I'm somewhere between thinking of doing something that's displeasing to Allah, and then getting close to it, and then stopping myself, maybe making the mistake, and maybe committing that, and then coming back and saying, oh, I have to make tawbah, but I hope I just don't do that again, and then, and then trying not to get into a cycle. So that's, that's one, one, one of the states. This. Um, Nafs al bisu is a state that basically is literally, as Imam al-Ghazali said, this is a person who essentially decided that there's just no reason for me to be fighting this voice inside of me that tells me not to do something, so I'm just going to do it. And what's sad is when Nike um, came up with that slogan, it, it really was very interesting because it 
kind of said out loud in three words, in three words, what society was essentially saying about hedonism. Hedon hedonism is essentially the idea of going after whatever pleasures and whatever satisfies us at any cost, at any, you know, just as it happens. And so Nike said, just do it. Just three words. Well, if you think about it, just three words, and it essentially started to characterize what life was going to be like for people who just do it. And this is that state. And it's a difficult state. When we do counseling, we find people who, for example, in the relationship with the wife, their anger overcomes them in such a way they kind of get emotional about it because it's gone to the extremes sometimes, is that they can't stop themselves. And so they strike and they strike and they strike and there's absolutely nothing that can stop them regardless of the pain, the, the, the tears, the, you know, everything. And so when that, when your soul has literally reached that depth, that state, that's a, not a point of, you know, you cannot recover from it, but it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot. So that state is something to be cautious of, and that's only something you would know, and I would know about our weaknesses. And the last one, of course, is Nafs al-Mutma'inna, which is mentioned in Surah Al-Fajr, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, and Imam Al-Ghazali in, in commenting on it says, that the Nafs al-Mutma'inna is a, a state of the soul, where the person who has achieved that state can literally achieve calmness under command literally achieve calmness under command. So you provoke them, nothing happens to them. Because in Thai, they've already said, that person walking towards you, it has negative energy, they're going to provoke you by saying something, just take it in and center your thoughts and it's not going to move you. That temptation is right in front of you, no one is there to know whether you fell for that temptation or not, just take a deep breath and it doesn't move you. And that's interesting. Because that could actually be something, a state that all of us would aspire for. And the reward of that, if you read the, the end of Surah uh, Al-Fajr, the reward of that, Allah SWT literally says, the people who have achieved that state, that it's a personal invitation from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to فَدْخُلِي ibadi, Enter, O my servants, وَدْخُلِي jannati, That enter into my heavens. Right? You know how like when you invite someone, you don't just say, come to the house. Because you want to be loving and, and generous, you would say, come to my house, or come to our house, right? My place, my path, whatever. And Allah SWT is saying, enter into my heaven. And so that state is so priceless in the, st in the sense of how to achieve it. But that, you know, it literally means that all of our senses, all of our senses have to be refined and recalibrated in such a way that none of those one senses is out of order. That the eyes do not engage in anything that displeases Allah. That the, the uh, you know, even the, the sense of touch. Because in Surah Al-Fusilat we know that the skin will actually complain against us. Will actually bear witness against us saying, he or she used me to touch X, Y, and Z. Like that's, that's, that's a scary thought. Can you imagine like unable to stop your organs from testifying against you? That would be like, I mean, you know, as it is with our friends and stuff, like shut up, like don't say anything, right? We're gonna get in trouble, right? Or you may text them like shut up, right? But this case, you can't, you have no control. It's just happening. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that that can also happen. So the nafs awareness in terms of a marriage is something that is a, is a, is a requirement, is a must. Because now, and some, husbands and wives out of love for their spouse will actually say Habibi, Habibti some actually say Nafsi some actually refer to their spouse as Nafsi like my soul and that's an interesting if your soul is out of whack if it's out of order if the states are screwed up and you're aligning more to just doing whatever is pleasing then you can't be of benefit to anybody around you right and so that's a, in the assessment of self-assessment for marriage that's a big deal uh, the next one is the relationship, I mentioned relationship with Allah first, the next one is the relationship with the parents. And here I can't overemphasize this because I will tell you again and again and again where I see marriage talks, marriage talks that don't go anywhere or that are troubled is where the relationship between the son, daughter and the parents is either weak 
it's absent. It's based on formalities where frank talk never really occurred, but there was just a lot of, you know, well, I'm your son, I love you. You're our son or daughter, we love you. But no one ever really pressed the real sensitive topics. And then marriage shows up or marriage, a prospect shows up and then things just kind of break apart. So the question to ask yourself here is, what are the channels of communication on this topic with your parents? So, I mean, I'm, a, I'm assuming, but most of you are in like late teens, like, you know, early, early 20s, whatever, to, but at least like 16, 17 and above, right? So it's a good time. If you feel you are now starting to think about men, women, women, men, and think about marriage, it's a good time. When no prospect is on the table, when no marriage discussions or talks are occurring, it's a good time to start talking about what are your thoughts about marriage. Because the bottom line will be, is it, do they say it's your call? Do they say it's their call? Or do they say it's our call? And I've had all, all of those uh, uh, variations. I've had brothers, ancestors say, I talked to my parents and they pretty much said, we knew you when you were a teenager. You left for college. You've been gone from us for six to eight years now. We don't want to do an injustice to you by assuming that we know you. So the call is yours entirely and we will support you and work with you. Not that they won't be at, you know, present at all in the process, but the call is great. Others have said, <laughs> we know you, we raised you, you are so not going to do this by yourself. And in fact, it is not your call, and it's our call, and we're going to decide. And some brothers have said, that's fine, uh, you know me, I just met someone last week, um, uh, actually two, two weeks ago, and uh, they said, and they, they came for a counseling, and uh, in, in one of these conferences we have these one-on-one -on -one sessions, and. I said, how did you meet? Because he grew up here and she was from back home. And he said, I just told my parents, I'm, I'm ready. And I said, really? He said, yeah. And he said that it was their call. And Alhamdulillah, you know, they came for like very minor issues, nothing major, but it was more so to deal with the pace of life and those things. And then the other one is the consultative process where you keep your eyes open, you keep your eyes open. If you find someone, tell them about me. If I find someone, I'll tell them about you. I mean, I'll tell them, tell you about them and we'll work through it. So you have to know that because it can't be that you actually, especially through college, MSA, uh, start becoming inclined towards someone and you've never discussed what your parents' thoughts are about this. You've never talked about it. That can be really tormenting to them because the worst violation a child can do to parents who raised you and literally brought you, you know, from as the Quran says, from a, a period of weakness into strength if you've never talked to them, it's the worst violation of their feelings. Because we think that, you know, I pretty much have my own job now. I pretty much can stand on my own feet. I can provide for myself. I have education. I don't really need them. And the problem becomes that this is a moment, especially mothers, probably have been dreaming about forever, ever, ever since they maybe held you in their hands the first moment you were born. They might have thought, I can't wait to be alive to, for this child of mine to be married and to be involved in that process. So you have to really be honest. And that's just, just about marriage. That's, not even, that's just even how are we going to look for someone. That's not even, and you're on high school and college campuses, if your interests, and I'm very frank here, if your interests in terms of assessing marriage are outside of your culture, outside of your race, outside of your socioeconomic background, you have to, you owe it to your parents to start talking to them before you have a prospect in mind. And I have absolutely no problem in helping people in that way. We ask very clearly when I help people, do you have any ethnic or racial preferences? Because assessing oneself for marriage also means to be honest. And some people, one of the brother, brothers told me, for example, he's of Egyptian descent. He said, I want to marry either a Syrian or a Palestinian. Whatever his reasons, whatever his reasons, maybe sometimes being honest with that is more helpful than to say, well, you know, my parents are never going to go for it, so I'll just marry. Because think about why maybe you thought you, get, you want to do that. Was it because you got along better with women or men of that particular background? For some people, you know how we say opposites uh, attract and likes what? Likes do what? 
repel, right? Sometimes people say that I'm from the same culture, I know all the baggage of my culture. If I marry a guy from my culture, it's just going to... Simple test. When your family has their intimate gatherings of friends, who comes? Who comes over? Who do they invite? I'm not saying that that's racist or exclusive or anything, but who do they feel most comfortable with that they can just let down their guard and be themselves? If it's people from your own background, most likely, most likely, they will not be open to a marriage with another race or background. You, you follow what I'm saying? Most likely. But if you talk to them, you may find out it's a surprise. You may find out that actually it, it does work. They're very open-minded. They just prefer our food, they prefer our ways or whatever, so they hang out with this particular culture, but they're very open-minded. But if you don't do that, you're gonna be stuck, right? And are you open and honest with yourself? Is it that you are definitely wanting to marry someone? And even for brothers or for sisters, you may say that I've talked to the brothers in this country or whatever, and I find them to be clueless. I find them to be not mature. I find them to be not ready. But I've talked to some of the men from overseas. When we visit there and whatnot, my relatives, I find they're, because of their life experiences, they're much more mature. You may feel that way, but if you never talk to your parents, if you never mention that to them, that's a problem. If you think in your head that you're going to marry someone who provides for everything, who does everything at home, you don't want to lift a finger and you say, oh, I'm not marrying an American Muslim sister because I know that's not going to fly with her. So I'm going to go back home. That may be an injustice to yourself and to the woman that you're marrying because she may, she may entirely not be ready for the kind of man that you are growing up here. Neither may you coordinate mentally and psychologically with her. So what is that process like? And how and where are the parents involved? So that's a big question. And I spend more time on that because even if you're totally self-aware, self-ready, financially ready, nafs ready, all of that is ready, if the parents are not in the picture, you, or at least you don't know where the parents are in the picture, my call, their call, our call, that's a big deal. And that's a big source of problem. So I'll start to close off there by saying one of the last things that we'll have Q&A, inshallah, is that, um, you know, permissible sources of income is something that most people don't think about. I think about whether they're ready for marriage or not. And yet, believe it or not, we've had people make, make some really bad choices. Really bad choices. The recent case, case heartbreaking case of divorce was that um, the brother insisted that his career was going to be in finance, but like heavily, heavily interest-based, and then realized that how profit-making it was because now the market is backing, uh, bouncing back after the recession and would not let go and wanted to invest more and wanted to do this more and that more. And the sister tells us that her insides were like they were being eaten out because she could not stand that this was the income feeding the family, right? feeding the family. So it's not just like the extreme is either you live poor and don't do anything or you live this way. There must be a middle path, right? So permissible sources of income means from the very beginning, every penny that you're saving for yourself, to feed yourself, feed yourself now, to provide for your wife, your, you know, your future uh, husband, spouse, family, whatever, they have to come from sources that are pleasing. 
the quick buck has never, you know, the, the whole uh, schemes to get rich quick. There, there may be some, but there's a lot of injustice in those schemes because inevitably somebody is being taken advantage of. Even being taken advantage of, one would have to think if that's permissible or not, or taking advantage of people, one would have to think if I'm you know, benefiting from them, is that permissible or not. And if you're in doubt, ask the scholars, you have Sheikh Abdul Rafi, we have Imam Majid. But you don't want to be in a situation where you've saved up and provided for that. A tragic situation was where um, the uh, sister or the brother uh, did not realize how the parents had acquired some of the funds. And he, his education and, and inevitably some of his Islamic education was paid for with that. And how sickening he felt, how sickened he felt when he found out that there were some issues or some doubts in the way the funds were you know, uh, earned. So we don't, you know, and my, 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 my best way of saying this, and I said this, I think, at the, uh, one of the lectures there, is that some of the best marriages I've seen, so when you start thinking about this, do not get stressed, is you go on Friday prayer, uh, your parents go on Friday prayer, once everything is settled, you're going to get married, and they make an announcement saying that on such and such day, at such and such time, in the masjid, we will have the nikah ceremony for my son or daughter. And everybody who hears us, everybody who hears us is invited. Everybody who hears us is invited. Not a list of people, not, oh, you know, uh, I haven't, uh, oh, Sammy, I haven't spoken to him for three years, I don't know if he can come. You know, oh, Abdullah, well, you know, we've been, we just saw each other last weekend. But then he's got seven kids, that's gonna do us out because every, every, <laughs> Plate costs like fifty dollars, so that's going to be too much. When you get into that, if you can bring people to the masjid, you don't even know them, and you just give them water and some dates, you can actually complete the rites of that uh, uh, wedding, and you don't know which of them made to offer you for that marriage to succeed, and Allah accepts that to offer. That's the critical piece, and I want you to really like liberate yourself from that pressure, because that permissibility of income often stems back to this part where people are stressed out and the weddings start to, the preparations start to create anxiety. One, one uh, engagement talks went on for three years and then they finally broke off. Three years they couldn't agree on. Most of the stuff was financially related on who was going to do what and how much was this gonna cost and this and this and this. And of course there was some long distance involved in terms of coasts, east and west coast. But it's a, it's a painful situation and you've invested that much energy into it for that things to fall apart, right? So I really, I, I sincerely believe that to invite as many people as possible and then make it an attitude, an outlook that says all the money we saved from all those major fancy wedding and arrangements, and it's not to say don't enjoy, you can still have your reception and invite your family and friends, but if you can, if all of us can aspire to save that money, then again, that permissibility of income comes back to if you save that money, and you give it to the new couple, and you say, go and start your life. Imagine what a, what a blessing. Because then they're not stressed for like the first six, to, six months to a year, because the finances are taken care of. The husband can actually spend more time with his wife. The wife can spend more time with the husband. Neither of them has to work several jobs or whatever to make ends meet. If they wanted to get a home, maybe all that money could have been the down payment for a home. You start thinking strategically, and many things open up. Many things open up, right? So just to close there, uh, you know, we always make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, indeed all of the concern that you show between you and your parents and your you know, grandparents and your siblings about marriage, it will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah that he will, you know, return your, your uh, respond to your dua and he will, you know, inshallah bless each of you with a, with a righteous spouse and uh, for those who are in the audience who are already married, uh, you know, will strengthen your marriage inshallah. So I'll stop there just to give enough time for Q&A and then I can go back to make some more additional points, but I just want to leave it open. So for those of you who joined us um, when it was uh, convenient for you, the first point I made was taqwa, that to be very aware of yourself in terms of self-restraint and the idea of God-conscious God or self-restraint is inspired by God-consciousness, the level of God-consciousness.